Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man who knows exactly what happens when your heart takes over your mind. Here is the captain. Yeah, it's the number one cause for aneurysms. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Get out your best beer glass, Captain, because we still have some clockwork tangerine-infused India Pale Ale from BrewDog in the old garage fridge. Clockwork has made a special comeback this year, and we are very excited to have some in the garage for this week. ABV, 4.5%. And how are we going to grade this one? Uh, How about four and a half bottle caps out of five? And let's give some praise and thank you to our friends that helped us out this week. First up, big shout out to Tonette in Michigan. And a big We Like Your Jib goes out to Kelly Howell in Conway, Arkansas. And last but certainly not least, we have Greg Watiziak in Queens, New York. Everyone we mentioned, they went and they helped us out with this week's beer fund. And for that, we thank you. Yeah, BWRUN Beer Run. Ladies, we got some new Lady Cut t-shirts in the garage store. So check that out at truecrimegarage.com. And that is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Twenty-one year old Fruke Leaves went missing after a night out at the pub. We already talked about a couple of communications that came in from Fruka to her roommate and to some family members. And a big reminder here before we go through these additional communications, remember that the calls were not recorded. The police were not heavily involved. There is no real investigation going on at this point. So when we go through these calls, these are transcripts that have been created based off of memory, reconstructed through the memory of the person or persons who received the call that were on the call with Fruka Leibs. We start off with Sunday the 25th. This is at 1028 p.m. Fruka called Chris, her roommate and friend. Fruka says, coming home today. Chris says, are you in danger? Fruka, no. Chris says, why didn't you come home yesterday? Fruka says, can I explain to you? I wonder if this is supposed to mean can't I explain to you or I cannot explain to you. But the notes we have say, can I explain to you? Chris says, where are you? Froka, I'll tell you when I'm home. Chris, who is with you? Froka, I'll tell you later. This is weird, right? Because not just the communication, but weird for the person receiving it. You got to feel like the roommate who cares about his friend and the family members who care about their loved one, when they are getting these phone calls, they, they, they come in unannounced. They come in, they may even catch them off guard. But at the same time, you have a person on the other end, the receiving end of the call, that's trying to extract as much information as they can from Froka before the call goes dead or before she hangs up. So your natural instinct is going to want to be to interrogate her, to question her, to, to, to get as much information from her as you can to try to help the situation. But the other thing, the problem with that is with the, the, the quickness of these calls with the short time period that they are on the call together, you got to be conflicted wondering, do I spend my time questioning her to try to get her to open up and give us some information? Or do I just be silent and let her talk? That way we do get more information. It's a very it's a very sketchy situation, a very kind of a catch-22 to find oneself in. Two days after she goes missing, her friends and family start getting some communication with her, saying that she's coming home soon. She keeps saying, I'm coming home today. She doesn't come home. On the 26th, though, 
which is a Monday, no communication. Correct. And so the next communication doesn't happen until that Tuesday. Tuesday, the 27th, we have Chris. He's at the apartment that they share together. And also at the apartment with him, Captain, is Karen. Karen is Fruka's sister. So the two of them are at the apartment together. Now, her mother and father were actually there for the majority of this day, but had left just a brief time before another mysterious phone call comes in. Chris's phone rings at 1124 PM. The good thing, the saving grace here is while these phone calls are not recorded, the timestamps are via his phone, his listening device. Chris picks up the phone. He says, Froka, Karen is here too. Froka replies, are mom and dad there too? Chris, they're gone already. Hey, I'll just put you on speaker. Froka says, is Karen close to you? He responds, yes. She says, I'd like to talk to her, please. Karen jumps on saying, hello, Froka, how are you? Froka Please don't ask. Karen, where are you? The reply, I can't say. Karen, again, come home. The reply, no, that won't do. Karen says, are you scared? Froka replies, no. Karen says, are you tired? Remember, we talked about what Chris had said before that in one of the previous, at least one of the previous communications, he said that she sounded like she was blurry. And we wondered if this meant like she sounded sleepy or slurring her words. Right. So her sister asked, are you tired? Froka says, yeah, very tired. Please tell everyone I love them very much. Karen says, when are you coming home? Froka, I've got to hang up. Please hand the phone over to Chris. Chris says, why did you leave? Froka says, you know that, Chris. Chris says, are you being held? Froka, and this is what's... It's reported as she says this very faintly. Remember, Chris says, are you being held? Very faintly, she replies, yes. And then all of a sudden she gets loud and goes, no, no. Chris, you know that the police are looking for you. Froka, yes, I've been away for a week. Chris says, who's with you? She replies, I can't say. Chris says, no, did you meet another guy? To which she replies, You have to know I haven't been staying away for a week because I met another guy. Come on, you know me. Are mom and dad there too? Chris says, they were here. Remember, he's already answered this question. She circled back to this question in the same phone call. He says, they were here. And then she says, tell them I love them very much. Chris says, should I pick you up? She says, no, that won't do. Chris asks, Can we meet up somewhere? Again, that won't do. Chris says, where are you? And now Froka says, mama. Chris says, where are you? Froka, mama. Chris says, where are you? Froka, mama. Chris says, are you afraid to come home? The reply is no. Chris says something to the effect of, we'll clean up your apartment um, some sources say that, that, that he said that the apartment is vacant. Remember we're, we have to translate this from German to English and some words and phrases just don't translate into something that makes 100% sense. Uh, so he's saying something to the effect of we'll clean up your apartment or your apartment's vacant and nobody will ask you what happened. Just come home. She replies, that won't do. I'm still alive, which again, it's, it's very strange because she's talking. Yes. And remember, she's already circled back to a question that he answered very clearly earlier with the, are my parents there? No, they've already left later again in a very short conversation. Are my parents there? No, they've already left. It's almost like between the blurry and the incoherentness of her questions and statements you almost wonder if she's drugged yeah or or again i mean if somebody's holding a gun to your head or who who knows how they're overseeing these calls 
they're policing your words and you're policing your own words because you don't know you may not there may not be a clear line a clear divide of what is right and wrong for you to say right if your life's on the line and she might be watching and monitoring the person that's watching and monitoring her so she's it's almost like um, some of her communication sounds like you know when you call somebody and you're talking to them, you talk to them, and all of a sudden you hear them typing or you can hear the TV in the background and they just don't seem like they're paying attention much. That's how some of this communication comes off, but I think because she's monitoring whoever's monitoring her and she's trying to see if w- what I just said, how is how are they reacting to that? And I I think the reason why she circles back is this we're coming to the end and she knows it. All my sisters here, put her on. I'd like to talk to her. Hey, I love you, and I love everybody, and tell everybody I love them. Hey, are my parents there yet? Right. You know, tell them I love them. The the mama, the repeat of mama is strange. It's because we have in other conversations repeating of words, and you wonder if she was trying to communicate something by doing that. And that's scary to me, too, because we've we've covered many a case where we know that someone was crying out for a parent specifically their mother on many occasions when they're terrified or death is at their door. And now this next part, captain, I want you to pay attention to, and everybody out there at listener land plump up them ear balls, uh, because listen to the difference in the words. Now this is again, we're just the same conversation here. Right after Froka replied with that weird statement of, I'm still alive, Chris says, are you with one or more people? Froka replies, please don't ask me. I'd like to be with you all. I'd like to come home. That's where your earballs got to perk up. And and the, the difference there, that's a huge shift in what she's saying. Because before everything was, I'm coming home soon. Right. We now have a shift to, I would like to come home. Yeah, it's almost like she is talking to her captor at that point. Mm -hmm. I'd like to be home with my family. Or she's giving up. I'd like to be home with you all. Or maybe if she was believing her captor earlier that I will let you go at some point. You will get to go home at some point. Maybe she doesn't believe that anymore. Right, but like, like I said, that's the thing about these. I'm just assuming, never kidnapped anybody, but I'm just assuming that if you did, you can say whatever you want until it gets to that crossroad. And I think, obviously, the longer that she's been held captive, the the longer she is not going to believe somebody. If he goes, hey, on, on, on Wednesday, I'm going to take you home, and that doesn't happen. And on Thursday, I'm going to take you home, and that doesn't happen. At some point you go, it's it's not going to happen. Chris then asks, when will you call again? She replies, I'm not sure. Chris says, please call every day. And then she replies, yes, I will. Ciao. Bye for now. So in this call, we have the sister Karen and roommate Chris listening together. And they both said the same thing, that Froka sounded slurred. And they both thought that maybe or suspected that maybe she had been drugged for this call. Well, and let's face it. Chris is an ex-boyfriend. They've been friends for a long time. She moved out there. They live together. Don't know if there's no evidence that they had any romantic relationship. But she's leaving the bar. She makes a text message. She sends a text message to Chris. I'm going to be home. She never shows up. He starts getting this communication. At first, if you're reading the story or when you start investigating the story, you go, got to look into this guy. Is this communication actually happening? Now, what we know is earlier, a few days earlier, the brother made contact. So that's obviously some evidence that Chris is telling us the truth, but it, again, even more evidence that Chris is telling us the truth because the sister is there. Correct. And I mean, unless he's working in tandem with somebody, right. Chris is not responsible for whatever's happening to Froka at this point in our timeline. Now, one thing that's really interesting, we would learn later 
okay? Got to be clear. Later, we're going to learn from law enforcement that when they were able to try to figure out the location of these communications, where they were coming from, where her phone was at the time of the, the communications, in the very first text that she sent, they determined the location of her phone to be near a town called Naheem. Now, this is very interesting for many reasons, but one in particular is after this communication right here that we just went through, Captain, remember she says mama three times in a row, her mother, Ingrid, goes to the police and says, look, my daughter's calling, communicating with us. We believe that she's being held captive. We also believe that some of her messages and words to us, sentences to us, are cryptic and maybe she's speaking in code or trying to tell us something, trying to get us to read between the lines. Ingrid tells police her concern is that reading between the lines of this last phone call, when she says mama three times in a row, that Ingrid had once worked at a school in a small town near Naheem. Ingrid would later learn this information and wonder if this was her daughter trying to tell them, saying mama repeatedly, that there's some connection to my mom to where I am, to right. where I'm being held. I can't tell you where I'm being held because they'll kill me. Right. But here's here's a clue. Here's a little clue. Now, we'll never know for certain, but it is certainly interesting. I still don't understand the hesitation by law enforcement to get involved. Once you have a couple communications that don't add up to the family and friends and we have a missing person, why isn't there more involvement by law enforcement? This call, unfortunately, will be the last one that she will make to her family. And think about what's very different about this call compared to the previous ones. First off, there seems to be much more desperation in my opinion, in her word choices compared to earlier communications. Secondly, this call much, much more lengthier than the other calls. This call is about five minutes long. The other calls, some of them were just seconds, were just two sentences and then a hang up. Right. Rolf Osterman, the lead investigator on the case, he said a couple of things. He said that he believes that this call was very likely a cry for help and that Fruka may have known at the time of the call that she would not be talking to her family again. Remember, she says a couple of times, tell my family I love them. Tell mom and dad I love them. Right. I love them very much. That's almost a goodbye. Uh, the mama, mama, mama could have been some kind of code. Cry for help. A very different call than the other ones. And then, unfortunately, this is the last communication that friends or family receive from the missing from Froka. Out of all the calls, the content of this call, I think, is probably more accurate than all the other ones because we don't have just one person trying to reiterate what they remember from the call. We have two individuals. Exactly. And here's an interesting thing to ponder, too, is that there's no doubt in the family's mind that the phone calls were from Froka, that, that it was her on the other line. They recognize her voice they know her better than anyone else we have no reason to to not believe them as for the text let's face it i mean the text could be from anyone could be from the captor right the family and chris agree that the first text was definitely from froka and i i believe that as well we there's a huge shift uh in in that communication to the rest of them that one was very personable, so I don't think trying to suss out the the what calls and texts came from whom is worth spending a whole lot of time on. 
I think all of us can agree the calls were from Froko. We don't know what puppeteer is is orchestrating the words of that call or the communication of that call. But the text, first one definitely from her, the other one's all up to question. But would you disagree or agree that she's being monitored every time there's communication? I would find it highly unlikely that she wasn't. I agree. And I, I'm with you, Captain. I feel like th- there's only one, two, or three possible reasons that the captor allows her to communicate. Either it's to buy time, keep the cops away, which seem to work, or some kind of fetish, some kind of sadistic torture, mind F situation, or three, it's a combination of both. Now, the police later, they get, so they get involved, they gather the cell phone data information. They're going to be able to paint a picture, get a picture of where these calls and text messages were coming from at the time that they were placed or sent. The first text, as we mentioned, was from the area of Naheem in the Hoxter district, population of about 6,500 people. This is 35 kilometers northeast of Paderborn, of where she was last seen, of the Paderborn Center. The rest of the calls in the text came from in industrial areas in and around Paderborn itself. Yeah, I think you could dive into these. There's a lot of information you could dive into about the whereabouts of these locations. I think there's evidence from her communication to her family and friends that she has been moved at some point because mm-hmm. she says, I was here, now I'm, uh, now I'm here. Again, we don't know if that's just a ruse to throw people off or not. And we don't know if there's some device that is moving the location of these calls either. I, I don't know how much that matters in this investigation, though. Well, I, I think what we have here is, like you said, her indicating that it sounds like she's been moved around according to what she's saying. And then we have the science to, when you cross-reference, it seems to line up with that. So she apparently, she the device, the phone that's communicating is moving. And the the second of the communications comes in from 16 kilometers, about 10 miles away from the area that she went missing. Interestingly enough, it comes in about 27 miles from Naeem, which was the location of the first text. One thing we have to point out here is that that first text that comes in at 1249 a.m., The first night when she's supposedly leaving the pub a little after 11, she says she's leaving on foot. But what we do know happened here, Captain, is she had to have gotten into a vehicle because that location, that location is 35 kilometers from the pub that she was previously seen with her friends. Right. She didn't walk 22 miles. Yeah, in the so course of an hour and 50 minutes. So basically what you're saying is that first communication, the night she went missing was that was a controlled communication. I think it could be, but what I think is happening here is I think that she, she's either, she's either abducted at this point and is unaware of it or which, she's in another town or she took a ride from someone thinking she would in fact be coming home that night. So, just to, to to flesh this out a little bit here. So that text comes in 35 kilometers from where her previous location was. And one thing that we have is law enforcement stating that they think we know she had to have get, gotten to a vehicle to travel that distance in that amount of time. We know she left with her phone. There's a couple of problematic things to the story here, though. Her phone should have been dead when she left that pub. Yet she places a text. Dead or shortly. Well, she borrowed her friend's battery to continue communicating that night before leaving. Right. So she gives her friend her battery back and then leaves. And then all of a sudden, an hour and 50 minutes later, she's able to text people. Because the text comes into Chris. So during the course of that hour and 50 minutes, she travels 35 kilometers or roughly 22 miles and is able to bring life back to her cell phone battery. This to me indicates that she got into a vehicle with somebody and maybe 
either borrowed their battery. Again, this was a very common phone in Germany back in 2000, in the early 2000s, or gets into a vehicle with somebody and, and gets access to someone else's phone charger. And so what would further indicate that she is not stressed out or unaware of what may be about to happen is the investigators are saying at this time, this time of year in this location in Germany, it's, it's light. Twilight is nearly all night long. So it's never particularly dark, dark. And he also says, because of this being a very busy area, a populous area and all the things that are going on, all the soccer games and all the football games or matches that are going on, there would have been a lot of people on that route that she would have walked home. And so he believes that she would have gotten into a vehicle would had to have gotten into a vehicle willingly because we don't have, there would have been witnesses that would have heard screams or witnessed something that would indicate foul play. I think that the investigator, the lead investigator, Ralph Osterman's probably right based off of kind of the chatty nature, the happy nature of that text that was sent. But it's very bizarre, and we've covered hundreds of cases now. I don't know if we've had a case where there's been so much communication once the person went missing. With the exception of Larry Jean Bell, but that communication was quite different. Right. Right. It's not, it's, it's not from the victim. It's from, well, it's from both victim and the captor, but, right. but what was clear in those cases, what is, what is not clear here in those cases, it was very obvious. It was stated. I've been abducted. I've, this guy's holding me here. That's not the case. Now, right. based off of the, the science, based off of the, uh, geographical locations of when these texts and phone calls are coming in. What police say is police police believe that she was being held in or near Paderborn. This just like she was saying, I'm in Paderborn. I'm in Paderborn. I'm in Paderborn. And that the calls and the texts to her family were uh, coming in from those locations, but police concluded that she was being driven around or, or believed that she was being driven around as these calls and texts were active, driven around by her captor, who they believe is very familiar with the area, this as simply a diversion, as a diversion, as a way to throw, throw the dogs off the scent. All right, we are back. Hope everybody's having a great week. Cheers to you all, and cheers to you, Colonel. Cheers, Captain. On October 4th of that same year, a hunter found a body. This is 10 meters off of a very remote country road, if you want to call it that. This, a remote area near Lichtenau. The body was really just bones and tattered clothing that were found lying under or near a tree in a dense forest. This area is called Tottengrund, which translates to death grounds or, or the death grounds. It was 20 kilometers away from Paderborn. The killer, according to law enforcement, must have known their way around this area, was very familiar with this wooded area because it was an obscure dirt road 10 kilometers off of an obscure dirt road that led to this body recovery site. And to get to the dirt road, you had to get to these narrow country roads. So it was a bit of a maze to get out to where this location is. And the investigators have been very public stating that they believe that this site was selected on purpose so that the victim would not be found anytime soon. This turns out to be Fruka, who had been missing. She's been missing now for 
four months, and then this body is found. Police do tell us that the killer left no clues at the scene, that they the, the scene suggests that she was killed elsewhere. The weather had erased all footprints and tire tracks. The remains were covered with sticks and leaves, but there was zero signs of violence at the scene and on the body itself. The bones at this point, Captain, were devoid of flesh, but the clothing was very discernible. So it was jeans, a red shirt, and white sneakers. These are the exact items that Fruko was wearing when she was last seen. Right. Investigators ruled this a homicide. However, to be clear, they have no idea what caused the death, what the cause of death was. And that was then and still to this day, they do not know the cause of death. The skeleton bore no signs of sharp or blunt force trauma, no stab or gunshot wounds. The hyoid bone was intact. There was no trace of drugs that was detected in her hair or bones. But of course, some of that could or all that could leave her system by the time uh, death occurred. That That is possible, but it's more likely to find um but because of those tests that they did, do the hair samples and the, the bone drugs normally uh, stay in the system longer in those items? Law enforcement said that she was killed within days after her last call. That's about as much as they could narrow it down, or at least what they're telling the public. It looks to me, with everything we've gone through here, Captain, that the only possibilities I see here is that haven't been ruled out would be suffocation or drowning that she was drowned and they did. They specifically did say that they ruled out an accident because there would be, they believe that there would have been trauma that they would see to the skeletal remains that was not present. Investigators scouring the scene also found a small silver cross. Uh, It looked like a necklace pendant and she did not own, according to friends and family did not own such a cross or necklace. Some have wondered, could it have been left there by the killer or could it just be an item that was out there by happenstance? It's not, it's not indicated on where in relation to the remains, this item was found. Right. But if it's found within, let's say a three feet radius, I'm guessing it wasn't just happenstance or on the tree that she was under or on her herself or under the sticks or leaves or debris that was placed on top of her. All these things would indicate that somebody left that there purposely. And the other thing of interest here is what is not found. And this is pointed out by police that Fruca's Nokia 6230 phone was not recovered. Her fossil brand watch, wristwatch, was not recovered. Her black purse, not found. Now, what is not highlighted by police and... So we, we just don't know if it, this occurred or not, but her undergarments, we would assume she was wearing them. They never state that they were not found, but they never say that they are found on the remains. Right. And I think that maybe they're, they're leaving that to as some holdback information. We already talked about Ralph Osterman, who would end up leading a sev- a team of seven detectives. This task force, if you will, was constructed for the sole purpose of solving this one particular homicide. No, we are talking about areas of Germany that are rather low on the crime rate. In fact, violent crime is very low. Murders and homicides, very low. Uh, Typically, the most severe crime that they are, are investigating is attempted murder. Um, that that they these these towns and cities may not even experience a single homicide in some of the calendar years. Right. Now they did look at Chris very hard. As you pointed out, it helps his case that other people were present and other people had communications with Froka after she was abducted. They also were able to clearly point out that during large portions of when she was gone, he has alibis, right? He is where he says he was. So he is not considered a suspect in this case then, 
nor now. Police tracked down everyone at the pub that night, as we mentioned earlier. They ruled all of them out as well. Uh, It's been reported that they spoke to everyone at the pub multiple times, not just once. They also looked hard at Niels. Now, I'm telling you, I'm a little suspicious of this Niels guy. We'll get to some people that I'm more suspicious of here in a minute. But they looked at him. He was the guy that Fruka was texting with that night. They had recently been introduced by Isabella. And they have this platonic friendship, but who knows where it might have led. Niels, his best friend, had recently taken his own life. And what we've been told is that Froka was helping him through this tough time. Niels was frequenting a cemetery where his friend was buried. Some of the location information that they get about the calls and text not all, but some do line up to areas that are somewhat near Neil's and where he lived and where he would frequent. But we should point out that they did interrogate him multiple times. They searched his vehicle and eventually by alibis, they were able to rule him out as well. Well, and here becomes the issue though, is because I think either she told Neil's, I'm going to come visit you or she, like we said, Hey, come to this pub. And he's like, I can't because I have plans with my friend to play pool. I'm guessing if they're, they're longtime friends that they both are grieving their friend taking his own life. And so she might've thought, Oh, well, you know, I'll leave this pub and I'll head that way. I'll surprise him. He might not even known that. And that, you know, between that pub and uh, Neil's location is probably where she was abducted. And so it would make sense that some of these locations would be similar because where she, because of where she was abducted, if that makes any sense. Well, the other thing, too, that's troubling to me is I keep circling back to the idea of what the lead investigator said, that he believes that she, based on the distance from the pub to the first text an hour and 50 minutes later, that she would have had to have received some help in traveling that distance. She would have gotten to a vehicle And that on that route, she couldn't have done that kicking and screaming because somebody would have witnessed that. And they don't have anybody to tell them that they heard or saw anything like that that night. So that first text, it seems to be chummy, seems to be happy. Either she's in the company of someone who will become her captor and she's unaware of it at that time. Or that first text that family and Chris and myself all believe did come from her from Froka didn't come from her. And somehow her captor was able to extract information from her that made it seem personable. Like it did come from her. Right. It's a, it's a very puzzling case. It's, it's one of the more puzzling cases that I believe that we have covered here. Well, Uh, it's also tough because all these communications, these text messages, these calls, Like we've said, and like you have um, so uh, astutely made us aware of, is these these calls weren't recorded. So you can sit there and try to dissect each communication, but we don't even know how accurate those are. Because I think the level of seriousness, once you know that she's missing and once you believe that she's possibly being held captive, the the serious level, I think, actually is a hindrance on you remembering the details. Yeah, you're, you're in an emotional state that you might not be able to provide the best information. Now, the lead investigator, Osterman, revealed that the initial investigation focused heavily on five potential suspects. Now, they due to German law. And as you know, we, we, we see this often here in the States as well. They were prohibited from naming those five suspects. Now, no doubt in my mind, Niels and Chris were probably two of these. We know that they were looked at heavily and both cleared. What we do know is a follow-up statement from investigators saying that all five of those potential suspects were eventually cleared uh, in this case. Yeah. I saw a, a report where they interviewed over 900 people. Yep. 
that's that's a lot of people that 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 are connected to her and her community. Well, 100 of those 900 were internet contacts of hers that were checked out. And there were over 40 properties that were searched uh, in this investigation as well. Now, here is where, you know, this. there's nothing that's black and white about this case, right? 50 shades of gray, let's go ahead and call it 10,000 shades of gray in this case. But one thing that gets makes it a little more tricky, too, is the potential of some really good suspects. And, and listen to this information here, Captain. These two have been dubbed the Lonely Hearts Killers. And some people believe or believed that this case was solved, just not closed. And for a time, I believe that police seem to think so as well. It's unclear whether they still do or not. But what happened was in April of 2016, a vehicle breaks down on a dirt road, this outside of the town of Bosborn or Bosborn. Sorry, doing my best there. This is 50 kilometers from Paderborn. In the back seat of this vehicle is a 41 year old woman who is in medical, in need of medical attention, big time. Or as we say in the States, bigly. The car's driver was forced to call the ambulance, but only because neighbors came rushing out to try to help the vehicle that broke down. So this woman's taken to the hospital where she would eventually recover from her injuries. We need to point out these injuries did not occur because the vehicle broke down. Whatever happened to this woman happened to her before she was placed in that vehicle. What the medical experts determined very quickly, what this woman was actually in a coma. Her name turns out to be Susan. She, she would later die in the hospital due to this head injury. Right. During the ambulance trip and at the hospital, doctors and, and EMTs noticed that there were wounds to her entire body. This included bruising, signs of being bound, toenails that had been pulled out, and rotting flesh on her tailbone area. Susan, and they've not, re- I could not find her full name. She's referred to as Susan F., would have had to have been lying in the same position for weeks to have that rotting flesh in that area. An autopsy showed that she had actually died from blows to the head. Doctors called the police to report this as a homicide. Police went to the home of the vehicle that broke down. So there was a driver and a passenger and this injured woman in the vehicle that broke down. They go to the home. The driver and passenger are there. Their names are Wilfred Wagner, age 46, and his ex-wife, current roommate, Angelica who's 47, right? They were arrested and charged with abusing the woman who later died. Now the man, Wilfried refused to talk, but Angelica immediately turned on Wilfried and spilled the beans. She tells police that the two of them took this woman captive. And when they realized she was going to die from a head injury, which she said, she sustained when she fell after a beating, they decided to drive her to her back to her own apartment. They were going to leave her to die there so that nobody would connect her death to these two people. But of course, with the car breaking down, their secret is discovered. Unfortunately, this one woman turns out to just be the tip of the iceberg because when they searched the home, this was this place was pigsty would be polite. Uh, cops found evidence that this couple had held other women captive. They collected personal items and cell phones from women who were held captive in this house. The house in the news was referred. It, it was referred to. Here's one headline for you in the house. Oh, sorry. Here's one news story for you. In the house of the torture couple, police discovered hundreds of slips of paper on which Wilfried and Angelica had gotten their victims to declare all of their injuries to have been self-inflicted. Those who have seen it describe the crime scene as looking like an indoor garbage dump. Right. It was cold and damp. The wallpaper was coming off the walls. There was mold everywhere. It turned out that this couple had scores of victims 
And what they would do is they would lure the victims in using personal ads referred to as Lonely Hearts ads with Wilfred advertising that he was seeking seeking a companion to live with him and his air quotes sister Angelica. Remember, she's technically his ex-wife, now roommate. The women would meet him and get tricked into staying there, I guess. I I'm I wonder if they were just taken they show up for a meeting and they're taken captive immediately given the description of the the home. They would keep these this couple would keep these women captive, torture them, and at least two victims died. One, Suzanne, who we already talked about, and two, a woman named Annika. You know, it does sound like there's, like this is an interesting suspect, but do we have any connection between our victim and and these two? No. We have zero connection other than the very uniqueness of their crimes and the weird uniqueness of what we speculate may have taken place with our victim. What I mean by that is these are two very unique situations in areas that don't have high murder rates. It's, I don't know. I, I get where you're going, captain, but it's hard for me to believe I'm not saying they're connected 100%, but there are similarities here that cannot be denied. So, for one of the victims that was killed, um, what we learn from Angelica, who, again, she spills the beans, she described how the couple tortured Annika, one of the victims who died. She was 33 years old. This took place in 2013. So this is inching our way toward when our victim, Froka, disappeared and then was killed. They, after death, they dismembered Annika's body. They burned it in an oven and disposed of the ashes on a country road. For months, the victim had been beaten, kicked, chained, and once almost drowned to death. Annika had been tortured and abused for two months before dying. She ended up being chained face down in a bathtub and somehow died of head injuries when she tried to escape. But get this, Wilfried texted Annika's mother using Annika's mobile phone after he had killed her to say that she moved to Amsterdam, pretending to be her. Hey mom, I'm in good health. I've moved to Amsterdam. The Lonely Hearts case was a huge case in Germany. Uh, Wilfried and Angelica's house became known as the Hoxter House of Horrors. The prosecution saying that they were aware of at least eight victims, but could not determine how many victims that had actually uh, fell victim to these two. I have a lot of the information on the different torture that they dealt out. I don't know that we need to go through and linger too long on those, uh, on those facts of the, of this horrible case. It's, it, it's there for you. If you want to, to find that information for yourself, but Wilfried had been torturing and abusing people since 1995. So he was active at the time when our victim goes missing. And again, their modus operandi with their ruse of getting people to come and meet them for a potential place to live or companionship does not fit with anything that we suspect was going on with Froka. But could they have changed their ruse? She was a helpful person. And there's a woman present that makes it, you see a couple, you're, it feels less threatening than when you see a single male. What if they pulled a Ted Bundy on her? We know she was a helpful person. We know she was into nursing. We know she took care of the disabled at that facility for over a year where she did an internship. What if somebody pulled a Ted Bundy broke fake, broken arm, fake, broken leg deal on her. So I, w- what I think is there is no direct connection. What there is is similarities in what I think may have happened and took place with Froka Leibs and what we do know about these Lonely Hearts killers. 
thankfully they were caught. They were apprehended. Uh, unfortunately, Angelica was sentenced to only 13 years in prison. Uh, Wilfried, he gets sent off to a psychiatric, a psychiatric hospital sentenced to 11 years. And that was all, all a ruse bamboozlement itself. Because once there, the doc- the doctors determine that this guy is not uh, in need of medical attention. He's in need of imprisonment. Yeah, very interesting suspects. It was also, there's rumors that she had a stalker, but w- what information do we have on that? Yeah, I feel like every, there's a rumor that every woman walking the planet has a stalker. The so well let's face it most guys are creeps <laughs> just know. driving around creeping out Creep, people creepy people uh th- this is difficult to report on here captain because there's not a whole lot of information so i wonder how much of this is just pure speculation but where this thought this angle for this case comes is from a german armchair sleuth website called all mystery and it was a neighbor of fruka's who told of a weird feeling that she got that, that she believed she was being stalked and therefore um, maybe her neighbor Fruka was being stalked as well. Um, look it here's, here's what gives a little bit of weight to this idea for me is that if she was being watched or followed or stalked, it would be very easy for that individual to, to be at that pub that night. There's a lot of people there. It's rowdy. People are probably not paying super attention to their surroundings. Who's around. We're all drinking. We're having a good time. We're watching football. So, and there would have been a lot of people on the streets that night, as we have heard from law enforcement, somebody could have easily followed her on foot. Somebody familiar with her could have offered her a ride. It's a very puzzling and troubling case. I wonder if the Lonely Hearts killers were involved, why that information would be left out. I, I, it's hard for me to sit here in a garage in Ohio and sift through all of the information that came out because we do know that one of the Lonely Hearts killers did talk to police and did go into detailed information about some of their crimes. Now, do I sit here believing that she would have gone into detailed information about all of their crimes? No. We know that one thing that killers, one trait that most killers share, they're liars. Yep. So it it's, you sit here and you, you, you try to, you try to sort this thing out. And really at the end of the day, all that you can figure out is that scientifically, the the evidence states that 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 device that phone her phone was being moved around at the time that she's communicating with friends and family and at that time it seems to be that law enforcement family and friends all agree that she was taken captive at some point during that week and was being held captive during most if not all of that communication it's very bizarre that she would be being moved around like that. I wondered this too, Captain, going into this. I know that here in the United States, we have an issue with a spike in human trafficking in the areas near and around the Super Bowl right. hosting city. And not, Well, not just that, but also any anytime there's a big, large event. Yeah, you know, I'm sure if you look up um, like Comic Con, or you look up some of these like the Arnold Classic. Well, even even this is gonna this is disturbing as hell. Even our uh, political parties, right? You have an uptick in um that type those types of crimes. Some of them we're we're also talking about you know lesser crimes like sex work and things of that nature. But there is an uptick in those areas at those times and human trafficking. And I couldn't help but wonder if the world cup being held in this area could have anything to do with, with a certain element being there and then not there. I bet, I bet that 
uptick is way bigger for the World Cup than it is for the Super Bowl because you have all these people coming from all these other countries. There is, last I could find, there was a 30,000 euros reward for information in this case. Uh, you have a family that, that is left with not just all kinds of hurt and heartache, but the, the amount of questions they must have. You know, we review so many cases that are so sad and heartbreaking of people that disappear. They vanish into thin air and you're left with all kinds of questions here in this situation. Yes, there was the remains that were recovered. There was a funeral service a very nice, beautiful funeral service. But at the end of the day, this family's left with a whole different set of haunting questions than those that lose a loved one that just disappear. I want to thank everybody for joining us here again in the garage for everything true crime check out truecrimegarage.com and make sure you sign up on our mailing list colonel do we have any recommended reading for the beautiful listener this week we are going to recommend one that we've recommended in the past but recently they did a launch party this last sunday june 25th down in orlando for this great book and the author is a friend of a friend of the show. We met one of his dear friends at our show at BrewDog just a few months back. So recommending this week, the aftermath of Jennifer Kessie's abduction and uncle's quest for understanding and inspiring life lessons by Bill Gilmore. Many of you will remember the Jennifer Kessie missing persons case. I believe it's an abduction and murder case. And I think many of you out there do as well. Check out Bill Gilmore's book, Aftermath of Jennifer Kessie's Abduction. You can find that great title and many more on our recommended page on truecrimegarage.com. Join us back here in the garage next week. And until then, be good, be kind, and don't listen.